I don't like the idea as an artist of anyone telling me I can't do this or I should behave in such a way or a fashion. That's why I got into the business to express myself, make people laugh, and make them forget about stupid stuff like that. I ain't got nothing against talking to him. Good. I have got something against listening to him. I was very fortunate to come along in television when there was an era of good writing, and we spoke about issues that caused everybody concern on Norman Lear's shows. I was very proud to be a part of that ensemble. Does this look like a man that's sick? Does this look like I got hypertension? Huh? A message of morality and inspiration, but wrapped in an envelope of humor, which is the best way to deliver a message. John Amos was America's dad. He was best known for his role on the iconic show Good Times, the first sitcom to feature a black household with two parents on primetime TV. It was a family in the projects, an economically deprived family. We began to touch on issues that were of concern to everyone. Things like gang warfare, an episode in which JJ got shot, teenage pregnancy. These were issues that transcended color and issues that everybody across the board regardless of their ethnic background, could identify with and could appreciate. But it was his clash with the writers that led to his dismissal from the show after only three seasons. My main concern as a writer and as an African-American male was that we not perpetuate the negative imagery, the negative stereotypes that had been foisted on the public for so many years on television and film. And I wasn't the most diplomatic guy in those days. So when Norman Lear decided and his staff decided that they had to kill James Evans off. In retrospect, I can understand it because I probably would have fired John Amos too because he, he was not the nicest guy in those days. I was what you call the atypical angry young man. Uh, now that I'd like to think I've matured, I probably would have approached a lot of the differences that I had with them more diplomatically. But diplomacy was not my forte in those days. And I was about, well, let's go outside, you know. I'm from New Jersey, and confrontations are part of life growing up in New Jersey. Do you, obviously, you must regret that now. No, I have no regrets. I was told after I was killed off of good times, you'll never work again. As God would have it, though, um, less than six or seven months later, David Walper uh, cast me as a part of the adult Punta Kinte and Roots. And the rest, as they say, is history. Being alone and being free, you're all the same for a slave. Roots remains one of the biggest TV events of all time. Back in 1977, the miniseries aired over eight consecutive nights instead of weekly because ABC executives feared it would not have wide appeal. But instead, it brought in about 130 million viewers, earning John a primetime Emmy nomination. It was a monumental moment in this country's history. Uh, I often I'm asked, why do you think so many people tuned in? It was divine intervention. If you recall, when Roots aired, we had one of the heaviest snowstorms in the history of the country on the East Coast, and uh, people literally couldn't get out of their homes for three and four days. And it just so happened that those three or four days fell in conjunction with the airing of Roots. Just you rest easy. I don't think any American or perhaps even any um, any foreign television viewers really knew the reality of the institution of slavery and how families were devastated and how uh, the contributions that we as a race of people were uh, made through some seemingly overwhelming obstacles. On a personal level, it means a great many things. It was vindication for me in a way because I was one of four African-American students to integrate the New Jersey school system. Uh, it meant so much on so many levels. John's career took off after moving west for college. He had a brief stint in the NFL before getting his big break as the weatherman on the Mary Tyler Moore Show. This is Gordon Howard filling in for the vacationing Ted Baxter. I was kind of spoiled coming out of the Mary Tyler Moore Show. The writing was incredible. The fact that the show won so many Emmys and the fact that each member of that cast, or the Mary Tyler Moore cast, was able to spin off into their own show successfully. I was a little apprehensive about leaving that show to go do an unproven product, but it ultimately turned out to be a good choice. He went on to amass more than 100 acting credits with recurring roles on Two and a Half Men, The District, and The West Wing. Yes, sir. And who could forget when he teamed up with Eddie Murphy in the 80s cult classic, Coming to America. Son, I'm just gonna tell you this one time. Yes, sir. You wanna keep working here, stay off the drugs.
worked better than I thought it would. It's terrific, man. It really is. And what about working with Eddie? Hey, it's uh, something you hope you can do and see James Earl Jones in the same company. It's great. I had a ball. 33 years later, he reprised his role in the sequel, but the biggest role of John's lifetime was being a father to his two kids, Casey and Shannon. I just called to say how much I care. I try and impress upon both my children and now my granddaughter how important it is that they establish and create some entity of their own that they can control creatively, not just for the financial rewards, but for the satisfaction that you get when you have something. As someone who's been uh, married and divorced three times, I'm not much on giving <laughs> advice about uh, matters or affairs of the heart. Don't take any of this too seriously. You know, it's not brain surgery. And enjoy the moment, because only God knows how long it's gonna last. <laughs>